What are cross-sectional studies and what can we learn about nutrition from them? Let's science it. Hey, welcome to Nourishable. I'm Dr. Lara. A cross-sectional study is essentially a snapshot in time. A snapshot that shows us an exposure and an outcome. In nutrition research, an exposure is often something food-related, like drinking soda pop. And an outcome is an endpoint that we're interested in, like type 2 diabetes. This study, published in the Journal of Nutrition, is an example of a cross-sectional study. The researchers approached this by saying, look, we know that there is an association between drinking sugary beverages and developing type 2 diabetes. We also know that the U.S. Hispanic Latino community is disproportionately affected by type 2 diabetes. What we don't know is whether there is an association between drinking sugary beverages and markers of prediabetes in this population. Prediabetes is a precursor to developing type 2 diabetes, when the way that your body manages blood sugar starts to get disrupted. Prediabetes is reversible, so understanding its prevalence in a population can help target effective interventions. So the researchers took snapshots in time of almost 10,000 adults in the Hispanic Latino community who volunteered to participate. The researchers learned about their sugary drink exposure by asking them everything that they ate and drank on two separate days. Tell me everything you ate and drank from midnight to midnight. Well, I had avocado toast and a nitro cold brew for breakfast, then the Beyond Burger with sweet potato fries and a soda for lunch. Tell me more about the soda. How many eight ounce servings? What brand? Was it diet or regular? This is called a 24 hour dietary recall. To measure the outcome, they took blood samples to see indicators of how well the participant's body was managing blood glucose. The blood tests happened on the same day as the first dietary recall, and the second dietary recall was a few weeks later, making it a pretty accurate snapshot of their current sugary drink consumption and blood glucose management. What they found was that people who reported drinking more than two sugary drinks per day had a 30% greater likelihood of having prediabetes compared to people who said they drink less than one sugary drink per day. Now, what does that tell us about the relationship between sugary drinks and prediabetes? Well, we can't say that sugary drinks cause prediabetes because we were just looking at a snapshot in time. Without following people over many years, we have no idea how many people would go on to develop prediabetes, with or without sugary beverages. We also can't determine the direction of the relationship. Do sugary drinks lead to prediabetes, or does prediabetes lead to drinking more sugary drinks? This is called reverse causality. What we can say is that there is an association between drinking sugary beverages and having prediabetes. Soda drinking correlates with having prediabetes in the Hispanic Latino population. Something to consider when evaluating any kind of nutrition study is how well the researchers measured the exposure and the outcome. One weakness of cross-sectional studies is whether your exposure measurement on a particular day is reflective of typical dietary habits. For me, I don't drink sugary drinks very often, but if I did a 24-hour dietary recall on a day that I went to my nephew's birthday party where I drank a giant root beer, my favorite kind of pop, then that would be a misrepresentation of my typical habits. The researchers from this study took that into consideration by averaging between two dietary recalls on different days. Plus, they had participants fill out another type of diet survey that asked about their food to intake over the past year. Together, these methods helped the researchers get a more accurate measure of typical sugary drink consumption. Not all cross-sectional studies do this extra legwork. Another thing to pay attention to is how the outcome was measured. In this study, the outcome of interest is prediabetes. This study used a few different markers in the blood samples to categorize a participant as having prediabetes. The fasting blood glucose that day, the hemoglobin A1c, which tells us about blood glucose levels over the past three months, or results from an oral glucose tolerance test, where they measured blood glucose levels two hours after drinking a sweet drink. 
If a participant had a pre-diabetic result on any of these measures, then they were categorized as having pre-diabetes. To me, that seems like a pretty good way to assess pre-diabetes status. Sometimes you'll see studies use a biomarker that really isn't related to the outcome, like using body mass index as an indicator of health. Which, just to be clear, BMI in isolation is not a useful indicator of health. Often this is done out of convenience, but convenient doesn't always mean informative or accurate. A study's conclusions can only be as good as their measures of exposure and outcome. If we can't use this cross-sectional study to determine if sugary drinks cause prediabetes, then what is the value of these studies? Cross-sectional studies are usually pretty quick to do and less expensive than other types of research. They're a good first step if you're studying an exposure-outcome relationship for the first time, or evaluating a previously established relationship in a different population. That was the case with this study, where the relationship between sugary drinks and prediabetes is well established in white populations, but not well understood in the US Hispanic Latino population. Cross-sectional studies are especially good for hypothesis generating. If you're considering spending boatloads of time and money to study a particular research question, then it's a good idea to do a cross-sectional study first to get some insight on the relationship between exposure and outcome. For example, let's say that this study found that the relationship between soda drinking and having prediabetes was particularly strong in Mexican mezzitos, but not in other ethnicities. Then it would make more sense to spend resources on studies focused on the Mexican mezzitos population. Overall, cross-sectional studies are a snapshot in time of an exposure and an outcome. They're pretty low down on our hierarchy of evidence. Cross-sectional studies can tell us if an exposure and an outcome correlate with each other, but not if an exposure causes an outcome. Correlation is not causation. This is something that nutrition media and influencers often get wrong, leading to over-extrapolation and unsubstantiated claims. Train your science spidey sense to chant this when consuming nutrition news media. Correlation is not causation. Correlation, Correlation is, not, is causation. not causation. That's what science tastes like. Thanks for tuning in to Nourishable. Link to the study I talked about today in the video description if you want to read it in more depth. Plus, check out my whole video series on the hierarchy of evidence. And if you value this content, help support the channel by sponsoring Nourishable on Patreon. We'd be oh so grateful for that cup of coffee while reading studies on PubMed. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all things nutrition.